YouTube, welcome. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Let me ask us all to stand, and we'll go to our next song, Standing on the Promises. You can't sing the sitting down, can you? So we have to be standing to sing Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> standing on the Promises, let's sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King That's where your hope rests in God's promise. Thank you. you. May be seated. A few announcements, but before the announcements, a few updates, some missions updates. We got an updated picture of Pastor Mujuka's family down in Shema District. Remember, last year we prayed very much for him. He was injured in an attack, and also for his daughter Brianna. We were praying for her as she went through several health things. That's been over a year, I guess, uh, uh, since then. Uh, but praise God for his healing for both of them and strength. So thankful for him sending this updated picture along with his appreciation of the support that we're able to send to help him as he goes out and helps with these church planting works. Brave is there, and they're starting a new uh, a Bible study class for the youth, and Brave is going to be leading that. So opportunities there. We get to we get to be part of their ministry in more than one way by having Brave here with us and now sending him back. So thankful for what God's doing there in Shema. Another update we got from the next slide. I don't remember which one I put next. Pastor Yacente. I saw him on, what day was that? Was that Friday? Friday. Uh, I saw Pastor Yacente on Friday. He had been in a conference in Tororo with Pastor Jaluge. 400 people. How would you like to be the cook? Whew. I think for like four days they were there, 400 people. They had over 300 pastors from seven countries come to that conference. And Pastor Yacente was able to go. Uh, Pastor Jackson Promise from First Baptist Church here in Matungo, Matungo went. Um, and others were there. And good time of encouragement. Be praying for Pastor Yacente. He's very, very busy. Uh, he said they have church plants in seven districts in Rwanda that he's trying to help. And not just the church where he is in Musanze, but the surrounding districts as well. He said people are saved, and they have no pastor, and he's trying to go. So very, very busy uh, trying to reach people there in Rwanda. I didn't have this on the, on, the, on the PowerPoint, but I do want to ask you to pray for Pastor John Busolo. He was on a motorcycle accident on Monday or Tuesday of this week, broke 
the metacarpals, the bones in his finger, and some other injuries. Um, I, I've tried to contact him. I've not gotten an update since then, but uh, they didn't. Uh, my understanding is they were not life-threatening injuries, but still painful, broken fingers. Uh, so be praying for Pastor John Busolo. Then our mission's focus this week is Pastor Aleo Richard and Miss Cindy. They just had a youth conference uh, the other week and had a great turnout there. I saw some photos. Uh, Prince was there uh, from our church. He was there helping out and, and praying that that would be an encouragement in his heart as well. Uh, but uh, thankful for what God is doing through our missions partners. And, of course, Pastor Anutha is with us today. So really exciting the connections God has brought to our church. And thank you for your faithfulness in giving. God is bringing fruit that is abounding to our account. We can't be in these places, but we can help them be in those places, and, and God adds that fruit to our account. So praise the Lord for that. Let's open with a word of prayer for our missions partners, and then we'll go to the announcements. Father, we pray today for Pastor Richard. I'm sure after this youth conference, youth camp, he's exhausted. We pray for Pastor Jaluge. He must also be exhausted. Uh, Pastor Yacente, who traveled through the night on Friday and catching up on things there in Rwanda. A lot of people that are, are tired, I pray that they would be steadfast and unmovable as they abound in the work of the Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us as Faith Baptist Church to be part of their ministry through financial support. Thank you for the fruit that you are abounding to their account for those that are being saved and baptized and growing and sharing that truth with others. We pray for the services in each of these places that we've mentioned today in Shema and Musanze and in Bali and in Masindi, that you would bless as the word is preached, that you would strengthen those churches, that they would be faithful to your word, that they would be faithful to their pastors and faithful in sharing that truth with others. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements. Okay, several announcements as we move forward today. Uh, and I don't remember what they are, so you'll just have to click for me and we'll keep going. The children, I was in the kids club today, had a great time. Um, if, you, if you would like to help with kids club, let me know. It's, it's fun. We have a good time in there. We sing songs. They memorize verses, learn doctrines. Right now, this is what they're learning, that creation. In the beginning, in six days, God made a perfect creation. And next week, they're going to learn about what damaged that creation. It's called corruption. It's sin. And so if your kids start talking about corruption, don't think they've been reading political news. Uh, it's sin that entered the world through, uh, through our first father, Adam. But kids are learning some great things in Kids Club. If your kids aren't there, let me encourage you to bring them next week, 930, so they can be part of that. It's important to learn the Word of God. Important for us to keep learning the Word of God, too. We have our new uh, leadership classes starting uh, next week. We'll have that launch. We'll have the videos available for download and the booklets ready. But I need you to sign up today if you have interest in that. There's a sign-up uh, form on the registration table. So please just put your name, contact number, um, so that we can be aware and know how to prepare for next week. There's no cost for these classes. And even if you don't have the data, you can download from the church Wi-Fi or copy off the flash drive and have them on your, on your device so that you can watch the videos on your own time. Uh, very, very helpful instructional classes, so be sure to do that. Then coming up, we have a marriage conference. Our title is going to be Remember the Beginning. How many of you remember your wedding day? Okay. If, you have, if you're married, I hope you didn't forget it. And like, was I really married? No. I hope you're not doubting that. Remember the beginning. Uh, that's going to be coming up on the weekend of 3rd and 4th of February. And we can go to the next slide, the times I don't remember, so I need to read it. 3.30, Saturday afternoon till 6.30 p.m., and then 2.30 Sunday till 4.30. We'll have those sessions for our marriage conference. The cost is 10000 if you're coming alone or 15000 if you're coming as a couple. And then we also ask each person who's coming to bring one gift that we can exchange uh, between five and 50000 in value. You can bring something you have. You can buy something. Don't bring a premio to give. Uh, let's, let's keep it in a budget, five to 15000 um, That way, everything is balanced as we exchange those gifts, and we'll have a good time with that. There will be other prizes, door prizes. Uh, but third, fourth of February, plan for that, and that will be right here at the church 
uh, the church building. Thank you for your faithfulness in your tithes and offerings. Again, we saw the report on the missions, how God is using that. And let's be faithful in all areas of our giving as God blesses. Let's be faithful in that. I want to welcome those that are here for the first time today. If this is your first time with us, would you just raise your hand so we know this is your first time? Okay, we have some Mazungus visiting. We have some others visiting. And glad to have you here today. Uh, we have some friends that we've known for over 20 years that are visiting from the U.S. on their way to Botswana. You didn't know Uganda was on the way to Botswana, did you? But it is. We just happened to make sure that worked out. Uh, glad to have them visiting this weekend and others visiting. Thank you for coming and being with us today. Let's stand and greet one another, and uh, then we'll continue with our service today.
Thank you, choir, for that ministry. Thank you for the bonus member, Eliana. We've enjoyed having you around. And well, we won't talk about that she's going back. So anyway, uh, good to have her here. Uh, let me ask you to, I'll let you remain seated. I'm being nice. I'll let you sit for the next song, and then we'll stand for the scripture reading, and then continue on with, with, our, with the uh, song of the month. So remain seated for this song. <clears throat> It's an older song, it might be a new one, but some of you will know it, so let's, hopefully, this will be one that we, that we know. Let's try this together. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. for some of you, but very good truths. When we have the truth of God's word, we see Jesus as that cornerstone. Talking about the stone, I'm going to ask Pastor Tony to come and lead us in our scripture reading. If you need to borrow a Bible today, raise your hand. We'll be happy to share one with you. But let's stand together as we turn to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. Psalm 118, 22 to 24. I'm going to read the first verse, and then I would like for you to join me on 23. So I'll do 22, you do 23, and then I will close with 24. Psalm 118, I will start with verse 22. I hope everyone is there with me. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Everybody together, verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Pastor Dan. Remain standing as we sing our song of the month. Song of the month, the ancient of days. Though the nations rage, it's happening, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all, so I will not fear, for this truth That my God is the ancient of days. None above him, none before him, all the time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name, for my God is 
the ancient of days. Though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, he is here with me. Praise God. I am not alone, oh, his love is sure, and he knows my name, for my God is the ancient of days, none above him, none be for him all of time in his hands for his throne it shall remain and ever stand all the power all the glory i will trust in his name for my god is the ancient of days. Though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete standing face to face in the presence of the ancient of days none above him none before him all of time in his hands for his throne it shall remain and ever stand all the power all the glory i will trust in his name for my god is the ancient of days. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor Tony, bring the word. My God is the ancient of days. There's none above him, none before him. Let me make sure, am I, am I can you hear me on this or is it up, down, medium, not so much. Come up a little bit. I got the green light. I got the green light, but it's not the green light for me to for you to hear me. Okay, I'll just keep talking. There we go. We're going up slowly. Pray for pray for our family. Uh, we are not losing someone for good. Now we're going real high. There we go. But we are taking her to the airport on Tuesday. So there's going to be some tears flowing. You know, they have the uh, Nam Summit, if you've heard about that, and the Chinese Summit. They've talked about all the roads being blocked. You know, is, is it selfish to pray that the road's going to be blocked to the airport <laughs> so that we have to keep Eliana with us for another week or two? Uh, no, but she needs to get back to university. Uh, so please pray for her as she travels. She's heading back going to be back. College starts on, university starts on which day? The 20, 22nd, okay? So just pray for that, pray for her safety. Never take that for granted when you're traveling by road or by plane. Uh, we just, we never know what can happen during those times, so continue to pray for her. Hopefully you have your booklet. Maybe some of you do. I know if you're visiting, you probably don't. We have a booklet that we put out regarding all the, the sermons, the series that we're going through. It was interesting when uh, Pastor Dan, several weeks ago, gave me this title and this passage to go through. I didn't know how I was, I was thinking through it, and when I saw the title, it said, Rebels in the Kingdom. 
I didn't know how to take that. You know, is he, is he meaning I'm a rebel? I need to work on it. <laughs> Rebels in the kingdom. I had a great time studying through this passage, and I'm, I'm looking forward to preaching it to you this morning. We're going to be in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 46. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 46. And again, we're going to be dealing with some parables. Earthly stories, heavenly meaning. Some parables. And these two specific parables we're going to be talking about obviously deal with what's in the title, and that is rebels. What, is, what does it mean when Jesus is dealing with these Pharisees? Who is he talking to? Who is, who is, how, how does this apply to us? Jesus was the master teacher, and he used parables many times to teach his disciples. What was interesting, though, is that not every, in fact, there were a lot of times when the message was not understood by who he was speaking to. How many times as we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we go through these parables that he says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And there were specific people many times, or persons, or person, that Jesus was trying to get a message across to. Here we have two groups that are listening to these two parables that we're going to see this morning. There were the disciples and there were the Pharisees. There were the group that was surrounding, listening to Jesus' teaching. It's very important that we understand that because of the message that is going to be taking place here. Intervention took place sometimes, had to take place, because when Jesus gave some of these parables that we've heard in the past, there were some people who didn't like what he said. People who didn't, that understood or that took reference to what he said or thought they knew what he said and, and it came back on them. As you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see these parables. There were times when Jesus escaped unnoticed through the crowd. We talked this morning in our Bible study and I, I enjoyed our Bible study that we had. Brian gave it to us, the authority in the Bible, our all group here. And there were several times mentioned miracles that took place. Brother Mainza mentioned the stretch, the stretch, things that were somehow normal. You know, when you deal with a worldwide flood, there are floods locally all around us. But when it comes to the whole earth being flooded, uh, that's a stretch. We don't see that normally. Here in Jesus' time when he was teaching and preaching and dealing with these parables, there were some, some, some things that Jesus said that he should have, they, they should have stoned him according to their law. And when Jesus gave these announcements, there were times when he just kind of walked right through the crowd, got away. It was a miracle that would take place. Jesus, in this instance, as we look through this passage, is giving a message that is, should get him killed. He should be in trouble. And that time has not yet come. But let's look at this passage together as we look at rebels in the kingdom. First, we see the parable of the two sons. The parable of the two sons. If you have a family, you have children, you know you've dealt with rebellion in the past, unless your children are perfect. And if they are, please come let me know so I can watch them for a while. Not, none of us are perfect. <laughs> none of our children are perfect. Here we see two sons, two sons. Both of them give an act of rebellion. We start out by saying, seeing the father owns a vineyard. And he wants his sons to go and work for the day. There's a job he wants them to accomplish. Let's start out here in Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read through this together. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 26. I got the right passage here. Matthew 21, sorry, verse, let me go to verse 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. The first son, he answered and said, I will not. Huh. How many times have we parents, I hope not too much, but especially early on and young, when you ask your son or your daughter to do something, and belligerently they just came out and said, I will not. How does that go? Do we as parents just sit there and go, hey, that's okay, yeah, you will not, fine, just go do your own thing? No, no, there is some words, maybe some actions. 
that come after that, a little discipline, maybe will take place. But this first son just boldly stood out there and said, I'm not going to do it, Dad. Sorry. I'm not going to go work in the vineyard today. It was interesting that Jesus used, and you have to understand, this word vineyard. So many times, even throughout the Old Testament, vineyard was used to explain the children of Israel. And here in this parable, we're going to see as we go through it, Jesus once again is pertaining the vineyard to the children of Israel and how it correlates with the kingdom of heaven. But in this, in this story, the father says, son, go work. The son says, I will not. But then something follows, which is unique than, from the second son. It's unique. Even though there's some rebellion being shown here, there's something that tugs on this young man's heart. And he comes back and says, oh, he repents. He says, Father, I changed my mind. I realized what I'm doing is wrong. I'm going to go and I'm going to do the work that you asked me to do in the vineyard. And we see that in verse 29. After he said, I will not, what does it say next? He says, and afterward, it says, but afterward he repented and he went. He did the will of his father. That's key. He did the will of his father. Now, he didn't do it at first, but he went after he was convicted that he should, and he did the will of his father, who told him to go to the vineyard and do the work that I tell you to do. I correlate this as we look at our lives as believers, as Christians, as part of the church. God has established a will, a job for us to do as believers. We have to make a decision. Are we going to follow what God directs for you and me? To go into the vineyard. I hear the vineyard, of course, correlating with the children of Israel. But as I correlate it in our lives as believers, our vineyard is the church. But we are to go do the work within the church, which extends to without the church. And that is the giving of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. How many times in the last week as we read scripture, as we study his word, as we have our devotions, does the father say, I want you to do this. I want you to go do this work for me. I want you to be a part. In the church, it could be a number of things as we are led to do. That could be ushering. It could be just being involved in a number of different aspects. Going out, giving the gospel, as I've already mentioned. It could be being in the choir. God's given you that voice to sing. Being in the choir. He says, I want you to come and, and work. I want you to come be a part of, of the church, doing the work that I've called you to do, being in the vineyard. Again, let me differentiate the correlation here because in this passage, he's dealing directly with the children of Israel, and I, I'm correlating, I'm applying it, it in, in some instance to the church and how we need to follow because this does relate to us. God does give us direction in his word, and we have to make a decision. Are we going to follow it? There was a time in your life when the Holy Spirit convicted you and said, you need to be saved. You need to ask Jesus Christ into your life. You can make a decision, many have, where they said, I will not. I will not accept Christ. I don't believe in Jesus. I will not do it. But many of you here today, you repented. Maybe you said, I will not first. I don't know each of your testimonies, but maybe there was a time when you said, at first, Lord, I will not. I will not accept you. But then as the Holy Spirit continued to convict and as the word of God continued to penetrate, you said, you repented and said yes. The will of the Father is that all men should be saved. The Bible clearly tells us that. And we are the catalyst and the tool to be able to take the word of God to others. But sometimes people will say, I will not. And then later on, they come back and they repent and they do the work of the Father. Or in this case, what I mentioned earlier, they will be saved. The repentant son. The unworthy made worthy. The sinner turns to saint. How many instances in the Old Testament and in the New do we find those that were looked at as being unworthy? made worthy through the blood of Jesus Christ because they accepted Christ as their Savior. You read in the story of the Old Testament about Rahab the harlot, if there's someone who should not have been allowed to enter into the kingdom or become at that time part of the vineyard, which would have been the children of Israel, it would have been Rahab the harlot. She would not even have been noticed or looked at or even thought of being included 
into God's family. But we see that in the circumstances that took place, and I, we don't go through the whole story, but Rahab believed as she heard about the story of the children of Israel coming across the river and they were going to attack Jericho and she, so she, she took it to two spies and they were discussing. She believed and we know that she put out that red scarlet cord out of her window like she was told to do, but it was through her faith, her faith in God that she was accepted into the family of God. At that time, the children of Israel, Rahab the harlot, someone who was looked at as being unworthy, made worthy. We could look at other instances throughout Scripture where that took place. Look at our own heart and our own life. Those of us, no matter what we've gone through or what we've been a part of, maybe some of us here even today were involved in deep, we call it deep sin. In God's eyes, there's no big, we've taught this before, there's no big, there's no little sin. It's all sin in God's eyes. But maybe there were some of you in the consequences of sin, you really delved deep into those sins and then you came to a point in your life where you were convicted and you said, there's no way God can accept somebody like me. And then as you continue to read scripture, you read the gospel is open to all. No matter what's happened in your life, no matter where you've come from, no matter what's taken place, it's open to all. And you became the person who was unworthy through the blood of Jesus Christ, you became worthy of Christ. You became worthy of the truth, accepting Christ as your personal Savior. So we see the repentant son. This son said no, and then he repented, said yes. Secondly, we see the rebel son. This is the one who was unworthy but remains unworthy. And it's interesting, we're going to see here in a little bit as Jesus goes into more detail in this parable, but go to verse 30 here, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 30. We're looking at this second son. Forgive the sound outside. I'll try to shout as loud as I can in my loud voice. But Matthew chapter 21 and verse 30, it says, And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But what happened? And he went not. And he went not. I rarely use my children as examples, and I'm not going to name anyone specifically because this is a general statement, but sometimes children think, you know what? Mom and Dad, they're going to forget. They're going to forget. And I'll tell them to go do something, and you need to go maybe wash the dishes, and then they know that Dad doesn't have the best memory, and they'll say, sure, Dad, I'll go wash the dishes. And then by the end of the day, you know, we, or whenever that allotted time is, maybe we get to the next meal, we go in there and things begin preparing lunch, dinner. Guess what we see sitting there still waiting? The dishes. So in their mind, they said, well, maybe mom, dad, I'll forget, and I'll just say I'll do it, and they don't do it. Here we have an instance where the rebel son, I don't know what was in their, his mind at that time, he just... He just thought, hey, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to say I'm going to do the will of the Father, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be a part of it. And there are many reasons possibly for this, but Jesus is going to point out, we're going to see this a little bit later in more detail. Jesus is pointing out there were a lot of people in that day that were acting like they were doing the will of the Father. They were good people according to tradition, according to their religion. They were good. They were following through, at least externally, what tradition had explained should be done. And the Pharisees were very well known for that. And remember, these are the ones that are sitting there listening, taking in this story. The rebellious son. The unworthy remains unworthy. The pride and deceit envelopes and is made known through this circumstance. Maybe the rebellious son, the one who said, I'm going to go and did not go. Maybe he just said, listen, I'm better than my brother. We'll get slaves to go do it. I won't have to be a part of that. I'll just make sure that I look the part and not do the part. The book of James talks a lot about this. And we have to be so careful in our Christian life. Because we've said many times before, it's easy to say, it's easy to, to say, I'm going to do this. Easy to say, I'm going to follow you, God. Easy to say, I, I, I want to be a part of 
doing what you want me to do, Lord, and yet when it comes down to it, our flesh, our, our, our being confused by what Satan brings into our lives, or our just rebellious spirit, we say no. We say, I'm not, not going to follow through with it. We play the part, but we are not doing our part in what God wants for us. So look at verse 31, the Pharisees and Jesus' response. So he tells the story. He shows what's taking place here on these two young men and, and their different reactions or different responses to the Father. And then we get to verse 31, and he says, And the multitude... Sorry, oh, my page got skipped. The fan played its part there. Verse... Doing it again. Verse 33. Here another parable. And let me, let me go... Sorry, verse 31. Whether of them twain did the will of his father... Now, the people that are listening, remember these are Pharisees. The first, they said the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Wow. Just think about that statement according to what was happening in this time. The publicans and the harlots, they were the ones that had to basically bow their head before these Pharisees. The Jews that were claiming to be the ones that were followers of God, and yet, again, they were playing the part and not being the part. Jesus said, yes, you are right. You made the right statement to these Pharisees, Sadducees, Republicans that were, I mean, publicans, Republic, publicans that were listening. <laughs> publicans that were listening to them. They knew when Jesus said, hey, I want you guys to hear something very important because basically I'm telling you, you're playing the second son, not the first. These ones that are the publicans, the sinners, the, the, the harlots, the tax collectors, the rejected, the ones that are the outcast, at least you make them as outcast of society, they're the ones that are coming into the kingdom. They're the ones that are going to be part of, of or are part of what I'm setting up because they've believed in me. And then what's unique is he goes on in verse 32 and 33 and he describes what John the Baptist was about, what he was doing, what his purpose was. He says, John the Baptist came preaching what? Repentance. He came preaching, there's someone come, coming whose shoes I am not worthy to unlatch. And yet... You Pharisees, you ones who thought you were better, thought you were followers, or think you are followers of God, yet you are not even willing to listen to two of the greatest prophets that were listed in Scripture, one being John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of the greatest prophet, the prophet, which we're going to see in the last verse, made mention. But you would not listen when I told you this is what it takes. This is what you should do. This is the will of my Father that you should believe. You should believe on Jesus. Jesus says, the public, the, the harlots, those that are outcasts, they're going to go into the kingdom before you. How many times do we cast judgment on those around us? How many times do we look? And I, God's worked in my heart so many times as I've walked the streets or driven down the streets and, you know, we come across people that we or God leads us to certain people or we talk to certain people. I think of specifically of, of maybe some cr people we look at as being crazy. We look at those people as the outcasts. There are many reasons why crazy people are out there. As, we've, as I've read studies, one is malaria, one is medical issues. And I truly believe another one is demon possession that takes place through certain rituals that go on. But are they not worthy for us as we are led to give the gospel to? Or do we turn around as we are, the Holy Spirit leads us to tell them the truth, we walk away because they are considered to be outcasts. Maybe there are some, and the word harlot is used quite a few times, and we know there are certain people in Scripture, certain ladies that accepted and believed in Jesus Christ that had that job at one point in their life, and Christ rescued them from it. They were the outcast. We have to be so careful, church. We have to be so careful that we don't lift ourselves up and think because 
we are involved in church or we come to church or that we're reading the Word of God or that we're, we are following through with some of the aspects of doing the work, yet our heart is far from them. We lift ourselves up in pride and we neglect the people that God wants us to give the gospel to, the outcasts. Pride, terrible, terrible scourge. So we see the Pharisees and Jesus' response. Jesus says, look, you had John the Baptist, but you would not believe. There are many who listened that you count as outcasts who believed. How many today are hearing the message to repent and believe and yet are stuck in their own good works? Boy, it breaks my heart when I come across someone who I'm talking to and we're moving away from those that we look at as outcasts to those who we look at as religious. And these are the Pharisees. And we talk with them and as I share the truth of the gospel with them, they say, listen, ever since I was young, I've gone to church. I've, I've had my rosaries. I've, you know, and, and we can mention several different religions, denominations, cults, that as we talk about, talk to them about the truth of Jesus Christ, they believe they are accepted by God because they are good, because of their works. And maybe that was some of you at one time. But Jesus here is still dealing with the Pharisees in this aspect that they feel like they are following their father's traditions and they are good people. John the Baptist, Jesus, is proclaiming a message that is truly the will of the Father. And he's saying, this is what you need to do. The Pharisees said, as the second rebellious son said, in their way they lived their lives and the way they were working in their lives, yes, I will do it. But yet, they did not follow what truly Jesus and John the Baptist were telling them the will of the Father was. The second parable, the parable of the wicked laborers. Here quickly, verse 33. Let's go to verse 33. It says, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen and they might, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Here we have basically another message that is being given by Christ saying that there is a vineyard, there is a people. These were the Jewish people that the Messiah was coming to and the time had come. Now he was sending, the Father was sending his servants to be able to take what was being what had been planted and what was ripe, what was getting ready to be harvested. And yet these laborers, and you can, you can put two and two together here and put this puzzle together in what Jesus is talking about and who he's talking to in saying, these are you, you are the Pharisees. You are the ones that were tasked to take care of the vineyard. And yet when the time has come for the harvest to be reaped, you are the ones that are stoning the messengers that are coming. You are the one that is, that, 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 that is literally, I mean, there were stonings that were taking place. In fact, they wanted to stone. That was their tradition. They, and Jesus, for what he was saying, they could have, they should have, in their tradition, taken him out and stoned him or thrown him off a cliff because of what he was accusing them of and what he was himself claiming to be. Jesus the Messiah. These men were hindering the work that God had established to be done because of their pride, because of their deceit, because of their misunderstanding and really lack of accepting what Jesus, what God had established according to His will. We can take this in two ways here as application. One, we understand that God wants all men to be saved. And we have to be careful. As we look at our own salvation, are we truly believing Jesus Christ because of His death, burial, resurrection, because of what He did for us and we're repenting of our sins and believing in Christ? Or are we relying on our good works to get us into heaven? That's the first question you have to ask. The second application, as we deal with understanding our church, 
God's will for us as we continue to live our lives to please God and to follow His word to accomplish His will, are we saying, Lord, I know what you're telling me to do. And yet, there's still that rebellious spirit in your heart that you're not accomplishing or following through. And there could be many different reasons why you're not doing it out of fear. Maybe you think I'm not worthy. Maybe Satan puts into your mind the fact that you failed, so you, there's no way God can use you. God wants to use you to accomplish His task, to further His kingdom, to move forward His church. You have to make the decision. Are you going to follow His will? Are you going to choose to obey what He wants you to do? We see this wicked laborers. Then it goes on here, if you continue on here in the passage. Verse, verse 36, Again He sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, He sent unto them His Son. I think you're seeing the correlation here. Saying, they will reverence my son. But did they reverence the son? When the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Hear Jesus. <laughs> I love the way Jesus sets up these men who think they are doing what is right and who are following, they think, following God's will and what has been established from the beginning. He asks them, who, what's going to happen when the, God, when the Father comes back and finds out that there were certain laborers that stoned or killed or slew his son? There's going to be judgment. Judgment's coming. And, and these men knew it. They, they basically just said, they basically said, hey, the Father's going to take care of this. He's going to destroy all those laborers. He's going to cast them out and He's going to put new ones in. Jesus, in His unique way, as He continues to tell parables, and I believe the Pharisees understood because of their actions that took place after Jesus had basically described to them what was going on. Basically, he was saying, listen, you Pharisees, you are the ones who are the laborers. The Father has sent His Son, the heir, to give you truth, to come bring in the kingdom, to establish what has been a mystery for so long throughout your lives now is going to be made not a mystery anymore, but it's going to be made a reality and it's going to all happen right in front of all of you. And yet, because of pride, because of deceit, because of power, a desire for power, because of a want of money, because of a desire for keeping position, they killed the heir. They killed the son. They killed the one who was, and eventually would kill. But correlating to the parable, we know the killing is coming of what's going to take place. Pride, powerful. These men, these Pharisees, rejecting the true heir, the Son, Jesus Christ, who was sent by the Father to do the will of the Father, to die on the cross for these Pharisees, they rejected. Jesus said, listen, there's going to come a time, and it happened in A.D. 70. And if we go on to read, let me hurry and read through here. Let's continue on. The parallel of the parables. Let's go to verse 42. Jesus said unto them, listen to what He said. Did He never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? That is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Going back to the passage we read for our Scripture reading. Therefore say unto you, verse 43, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Whew. What a powerful condemnation, judgment being brought down. And these men realized it. These men realized Jesus was talking about them. 
the head of the cornerstone. In buildings there in the New Testament, there was a, a stone put on the corner, usually on the upper right-hand corner of the building. It was a stone that really held everything together. There was that headstone. Also, there was also the chief cornerstone, which they used, which was also placed in the foundation. But it was the one that was the most important. Jesus Christ being considered many times to be the cornerstone. And when rejection of the cornerstone takes place, the building, what they had established, these, these children of Israel, it was going to crumble. It was going to fall apart. There was going to be a crushing and a judgment that was going to take place. And we see this happening in AD 70 when Titus came as a general with the Roman Empire. When the Jews were up in rebellion, he came and they basically crushed every stone of the temple was destroyed. There were so many people, if you read Josephus and what happened there in AD 70, you can understand and see the judgment that took place when the Jews, they never understood in their minds what they were saying, let the blood of our children be, or let the blood of Jesus be upon us and our children. This literally took place not too many years, just a generation after in AD 70 when that Roman general came in and just completely crushed the city of Jerusalem and so many within rejection of Jesus we have an opportunity today we have an opportunity not just to be hearers of the word to be doers we have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone instead of rejecting him twofold and we'll summarize here with three points the last part of our message, we'll summarize with three points. First, and we'll go on to the next slide here. For sake of time, we'll get to the next one. Be doers of the word, salvation and sanctification. Whatever Jesus is telling you to do today, do it. Whatever the word of God is, is ascribed to you, maybe it's you need to be saved. You need to accept Jesus Christ. Be a doer of the word. Maybe you need to give your heart to Christ. Maybe he's describing and saying you need to get involved within the church. You need to come do some work for me. You have a choice. Am I going to do it or am I not? We should be ready to do the will of our Father. What he ex what ex expects, let me put it that way, expects for us to do. Don't reject Jesus. Don't reject Jesus. In regards to salvation, we don't know how long the call will be. The call is there. We want you to accept Jesus Christ if you don't know him. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Don't reject Jesus. Don't reject what he's telling you in his word to do. With heads bowed and eyes closed, thank you for your attention today.